Lux presents Hollywood. The Lux Radio Theater brings you Rosalind Russell and Herbert Marshall in Craig's Wife with Beulah Bondi. Ladies and gentlemen, your producer, Mr. Cecil B. DeMille. <laughs> Greetings from Hollywood, ladies and gentlemen. Tonight's play, Craig's Wife, will probably remind all drama critics that women are unpredictable. For though the critics praised the drama when it opened on Broadway, they all added wisely, the women won't like it. But the unpredictable ladies loved it. A few months later, George Kelly's play won the Pulitzer Prize, then went the way of all hit plays and became a hit motion picture. Tonight you'll hear the same fine actress who played Craig's wife on the screen, Rosalind Russell. And co-starring with her, we present a longtime favorite of this audience, Herbert Marshall. Just why the critics thought women wouldn't like Craig's wife is a little hard for me to guess. It's an honest play, and in my opinion, women admire honesty in drama as well as in husbands. It's the story of a woman who made the fatal mistake of letting love come second, and that's very unusual for a woman. And here's a story in figures that I hope is not unusual. Ordinarily, figures make pretty dull reading, but we got a real thrill out of these in a letter from a calculating woman, the only kind of calculating woman we like. She writes, We've used Lux Toilet Soap exclusively in my home since December 1926, and multiplied out, that comes to something over 500 cakes. How's that for a record? And we are farmers, not screen stars. <laughs> that's, nearly, that's nearly 15 years, so the lady must have been satisfied. Personally, we think the farmers of this country have pretty good judgment. So when they pin a blue ribbon on our product, it's something to boast about. And 500 cakes of Lux toilet soap certainly spell enthusiasm to anybody. And now, a rising curtain spells the beginning of tonight's play. Here's the first act of Craig's Wife, starring Rosalind Russell as Harriet Craig, Herbert Marshall as Walter, and Beulah Bundy as Miss Austin. This is the living room of Mrs. Craig's house. Like a room in a shop window, it's cold, austere, and beautiful. A room meant to be admired, but not lived in. Its hardwood floors are too shiny. The drapes hang in much too perfect folds. There are no ashtrays, for Mrs. Craig discourages smoking in this room. It's like the other rooms of the house, in that it reflects the excellent taste and the fanatical neatness of its mistress. At present, Mrs. Craig is not at home. But as if anticipating her immediate return, two maids are feverishly dusting the spotless furniture. Do you think I ought to dust the top of the fireplace, Mrs. Harrell? Now, Maisie, you know better than that. Just dust every square inch of this room. But it don't need it, Mrs. Harrell. Just the same, do it. If there's a speck of dust, she'll find it. Mrs. Craig never looks where I have dusted. She always looks where I ain't. And even if I have... Maisie! She... Don't touch that vase. What's the matter? Put it down. Put it down. You know she can't stand for anybody to touch that vase except herself. I just wanted to dust up here. Well, don't ever touch that vase. If it ever got broken, she'd raise the roof. Here, put the newspaper on the table in the hall. That's where she likes it. She's too fussy. Paper says more rain tomorrow. Mrs. Craig won't like it. It may not be raining in Albany. I wonder how her sister's getting along. If you ask me, she's pretty sick. Mrs. Craig would never leave here in a million years if she didn't have to. Say, say, Mrs. Harrow, didn't you used to work out on Willis Avenue one time? For two years, yes. Why? Did you know any people out that way by the name of Passmore? I don't think so. Uh, why? Well, it says here in the paper that they were both found dead this morning in their home. Good heavens. What happened to them? It says, uh, a fashionable Willis Avenue residence scene of double tragedy. Bodies of J. Fergus Passmore and wife socially prominent in this city found dead in home from bullet wounds. Cause of death shrouded in mystery. Police working on identity of gentleman visitor seen leaving premises in automobile shortly after midnight. 
How awful. I wonder if Mr. Craig knew him. Mm, probably. Passmore. Now that I come to think of it, I'm sure I've heard him mention that name. You want to hear more? No, we haven't time. It'd be just like Mrs. Craig to walk in on us before we're done with the work. I thought you said she wouldn't be back before Saturday. Well, that's what she told me before she went up to Albany. But it's just as well to keep a day or two ahead of a woman like Mrs. Craig. But the house is clean, Mrs. Harold. There ain't a pin out of place. There never is. If Mrs. Craig gets an idea, there is. Sick sister or not, she'll take the first train home. Get to work. <laughs> Aunt Harriet. Yes, dear? What's the matter? Aunt Harriet, I hope I'm doing the right thing. Of course you are, Ethel. Your mother's had heart attacks before and come through them all right. She'll do the same thing this time. But I should be there, Aunt Harriet. Suppose something should happen. Nothing's going to happen, dear. The doctor certainly didn't think it was so serious when he suggested you come visit me. And I certainly wouldn't have left my only sister if I thought anything was going to happen. I do have to get back to the house, but just the same, I would have stayed there as long as it was necessary. But there were some things I wanted to tell Mother. Were they important? Well, it was about Professor Fredericks at school. Mother met him and liked him very much. She said she'd be glad if I married him. I wanted to tell her. You mean he said something? Yes. He's asked me to marry him soon. I don't know why your mother should be so panicky about your future, Ethel. You're only 19. She said she'd like to feel that I have somebody. Well, why does a girl need anybody, dear, if she has money to get along on? I wouldn't allow your mother's apprehensions to rush you into marriage, unless, of course, it were an advantageous marriage. Did you accept this man when he asked you? Practically, yes. But how does he expect to support you on a professor's salary? He's very lucky if he's getting $200 a month. Unless he's some very extraordinary kind of professor. He's a professor of the Romance languages. Naturally. And I suppose he's told you he loves you in all of them. Well, I certainly shouldn't care to think about marriage at all, Aunt Harriet, unless I were at least in love with a man. Oh, that's just your age, Ethel, darling. We all pass through that. It's the snare of romance. You'll find out later it's nothing more than the most impractical sentimentality. Why, Aunt Harriet? Unfortunately, the majority of women are caught with the spell of it. And then they're obliged to revert right back to the feminine dependence and subjection they've been trying to rid themselves of for centuries. Well, you married, Aunt Harriet. But not with any romantic illusions, dear. I saw to it that my marriage should be a way toward emancipation for me. It isn't financial independence that I speak of particularly. I knew that would come as a result of another kind of independence. And that's the independence of authority over the man I marry. I, I don't understand what you mean, Aunt Harriet. I mean that I'm simply extracting my share of the bargain. Your Uncle Walter wanted a wife and a home and all the things that go with marriage. Well, he has them. He can be sure of them. But I want to be sure of them, too. And someday I will be. But how? By securing into my hands the control of my husband. But suppose they were to find out sometime. Find out? Find out what? That you wanted to control him. <laughs> One never understands, dear, what it is not in one's nature to understand. Oh, Ethel, I know you're mentally deploring my lack of nobility. No. Yes, you are. I see it in your face. You think I am a very sordid woman. No, but frankly, Aunt Harriet, I don't think it's quite honest. But it's very much safer, my dear, for everybody. If a woman is the right kind of woman, it's safer that the destiny of her home be in her hands rather than in her husband's. <laughs> Oh, how do you do, Mrs. Craig? You're back ahead of time. Hello, Maisie. Yes, a little. Will you take these bags, please? Put my niece's things in the corner room. She'll be with us for the next few days. Yes, ma'am. Take your things off, Ethel, dear. Maisie, I wish you'd use the back way when you go up and down stairs. Oh, I always keep forgetting that. That stairway will begin to look as the way it did before, with everybody tramping up and down it every five minutes. Yes, ma'am. I'm sorry. Oh, hello, Mrs. Craig. I see your bag. Hello, Mrs. Harold. This is Ethel Landreth, my niece. Pleased to meet you. How do you do? And Harriet, I think I'll go upstairs and rest for a while. You don't mind? Of course not, child. Don't forget, dinner's at seven. I'll be down before that. Well, Mrs. Harold, everything been all right while I was away? <laughs> Everything's fine, Mrs. Craig. Who moved that vase? Why, it 
was moved in the dusting. Mrs. Harold, you know perfectly well I gave orders that no one was to touch that vase. Yes, ma'am, I know, but... Well, will you please see that it is not moved again? Where did these roses come from? Why, Mrs. Frazier brought them over. Mrs. Frazier? The lady across the street. She brought them over for Mr. Craig's aunt. Well, you'd better take them out of here. The petals will be all over the room. Is Mrs. Frazier upstairs with Auntie Austin again? Yes, ma'am. And how did she happen to get up there? Well, I don't know, I'm sure, Mrs. Craig, unless Miss Austin asked her. Oh, all right. Have there been any letters or messages for me, Mrs. Harold? Why, uh, there were two letters, yes. I left them in your room. And uh, there's a gentleman called Mr. Craig last night about 8 o'clock, but he'd gone out. I gave him the telephone number where Mr. Craig said he'd be. Who called Mr. Craig? Did you get his name? Yes, ma'am. He said his name was Burkmeyer. What number was it Mr. Craig gave you last night? Why, it was, um, Levering 3100. I wrote it down so I wouldn't forget it. All right, Mrs. Harold, that'll be all. Oh, wait. Uh, tell Maisie to fix the latch on the screen door. It was half open when I came in. I will, Mrs. Craig. Information. Hello. Could you give me the address of the telephone number Levering 3100? I'm sorry, I don't have that information. Oh. Well, uh, it isn't important. Thank you very much. Harriet. Harriet, where are you? Hello, Walter. Oh, I saw your grips on the porch. Oh, dear, hasn't Maisie taken them up yet? Darling, it's wonderful to see you. When did you get in? Careful, Walter. Don't muss my hair. We came a few minutes ago. How is Estelle? Better? Oh, nothing more than usual. You'd have thought from her letter that she was dying. So I have to race up to Albany and leave the house for a whole week. Incidentally, I brought Ethel back with me. She's upstairs resting. Oh, well, that's nice. Well, I'm glad to have you back again, darling. <laughs> oh, stop it, Walter. You'll break my bones. <laughs> <laughs> that's what I think I'd like to do sometimes. <laughs> now, stop it, please. Here, take your hat and put it there where it belongs. And take your paper out of here, too. The room's a sight. Your aunt's company will be scandalized. All right. Has, um... Auntie Austin got some company? The Lady of the Roses across the street. Mrs. Frazier? Yes. She's getting very sociable. Well, she certainly has some beautiful roses over there. I've talked to her a couple of times on the way up from the garage. You mean she's talked to you? Now, just what do you mean by that? Uh, Walter, don't lean against the piano. You'll scratch it. My this coat won't scratch well, it. Well, there might be something in your pocket that will. All right. What do you, uh, you mean about Mrs. Frazier? Isn't it obvious? Well, now, don't tell me you're jealous, darling. Oh, not at all. I'm simply suspicious of middle-aged widows who specialize in wayside roses. I'd like to be able to see just what's going on in your mind, darling. Well, if you could, I dare say you'd find something very similar to what's going on in the minds of most of our neighbors these days. Our neighbors? They have eyes, Walter, and they use them. And I wish you'd use yours. And I also wish you'd tell me whose telephone number 113100 is. Fergus Passmore, why? Oh. Mrs. Harold told me you gave her that number in case anybody wanted you. And I was wondering where it was. Fergus Passmore's. I was playing cards out there last night, a little poker. What did Billy Burkmeyer want you for? Oh, Fergus told me to get a hold of him, too, and bring him along. I hope you're not going to get into card playing again, Walter. Why, well, I never gave up card playing. Well, you haven't played in nearly a year. Well, I suppose that's because you don't play. I don't believe Fergus would have asked me yesterday, only that I happened to mention that you were away. Was his wife there? Yes, yeah, she was for a while, but she went out. I suppose that's the reason Fergus asked you, wasn't it? What do you mean? Well, you know how insanely jealous of her he used to be. Oh, I'm sure he was never jealous of me. Oh, he was jealous of everybody from what I could see. I'm sorry you have to go so soon, Mrs. Frazier. Here she comes. It's almost dinner time. I really must. I'm getting out of here. I don't want to have to sit and listen to her. Why, Harriet, I didn't know you were here. Hello, Auntie Austin. I only got in a little while ago. Good afternoon, Mrs. Craig. How do you do? I haven't even unpacked yet. Will you excuse me? Maisie, will you bring up the grips, please? Mrs. Frazier, I think my wife's a little upset. Of course. Miss Austin told me about her sister. I'm so sorry. You'll come again sometime, won't you? I'd love to. Goodbye, Mr. Craig. Goodbye. Goodbye, Miss Austin. Goodbye, dear. <laughs> And I think it was time I came back, Auntie Austin. 
From the looks of things, if I'd stayed away much longer, I'd probably have found my house the thoroughfare for the entire neighborhood. You mean Mrs. Fraser being here today? You know perfectly well what I mean, Auntie Austin. How did she happen to get in here? Why, I asked her in, of course. She brought over some roses. And you walked right into the trap. Oh, I do wish Maisie would learn to keep those drapes straight. Why do you think Mrs. Fraser is so anxious to get in here, Harriet? For the same reason that a lot of other women are in this neighborhood want to get in here, to satisfy their vulgar curiosity. I'll not allow it. Let them tend to their houses and they'll have plenty to do. I don't want a lot of idle neighbors on visiting terms. A good neighbor is a very good thing sometimes. You may have them. I don't want them running in and out every time I get my back turned. None of them has ever run in or out to you, so far as I remember. Well, she was just in my house, wasn't she? And your husband's house. Well, she was hardly here to see my husband. Or was she? No, she was not. Although you'd try to make Walter believe it if you could. Mrs. Fraser was here to see me, your husband's aunt. And I don't believe Walter would appreciate your attitude if he knew it. Well, you'll probably tell him. I have a lot of things to tell Walter, Harriet. I've no doubt you have. I've had plenty of time to think about them during the past two years, up there in my room. I'm going to tell him, and I want you here when I do, so that you won't be able to twist what I say. I merely want you to understand that I resent your having Mrs. Fraser in my house. Oh, why pick on Mrs. Fraser? Be honest about it, Harriet. You don't want anybody in your precious house. I don't want her. You don't want your husband. Only that he's necessary to the upkeep here. If you could see how that could be managed, his position here would be no more secure than that pillow there. Well, that's a very nice thing for you to say to me. It's the truth, whether you like to hear it or not. You want your house, Harriet, and that's all you do want. And that's all you'll have at the finish unless you change your way. Remember this, Harriet Craig. People who live to themselves are generally left to themselves. Does that mean that you are leaving us, Auntie Austin? Yes, I'm leaving. Only before I go, I want Walter to understand why. Dear, what's the matter? Auntie Austin tells me she's going to leave us. It's nothing very new, Walter. Why, what's happened? What did you say to her, Harriet? I haven't said anything to her, of course. Harriet... She's simply using her imagination. You never say anything. You simply act, and then you leave it for us to interpret, if we're able. Well, I hope I'm open to conviction if you have a grievance. It isn't my own cause I'm going to plead. I won't be here. It's for you. I don't understand what you mean, Auntie. That's probably the greatest danger, Walter, you don't understand. If you did, it would be scarcely necessary to warn you. Of what? Your wife. <laughs> what are you laughing at, Harriet? <laughs> oh, now, don't you think that's very amusing? <laughs> Harriet isn't really laughing, Walter. <laughs> well, what am I doing, crying? <laughs> You're whistling in the dark. You're terrified your secret has been discovered. Really? And what is my secret? I knew it a long time ago, Harriet, long before mm. your outburst against Mrs. Fraser a few minutes ago. <laughs> she means I've been trying to poison you secretly, Walter. Not <laughs> so secretly. Well, I'm sorry I must go, because I'm sure this is going to be very amusing. Harriet, I wish you would stay if Auntie has something to say against you. I think it's only fair... I'll not stay and listen to a lot of absurdities. I hope, Miss Austin, that when you finish discussing me... You'll be as frank in letting Walter know something of what I've been putting up with during the past two years. I wish you'd tell me what's happened, Auntie. That isn't so easy to tell a man, Walter. It requires a bit of elucidation. To begin with, nobody could like Harriet. She doesn't want them to. I like her. You're blinded by her, as many another man has been blinded by a beautiful woman. But what has she done? She's left you practically friendless, for one thing. She's made it perfectly clear to all your friends by a thousand little gestures that they are not welcome in your house, because this is her house. It isn't yours, Walter. You merely went with the house as a sort of regrettable necessity. Now, you... You don't really mean... You can't mean that, Auntie, now can you? Walter... Don't you realize that none of your friends has been here for 18 months? Why? Because she's a supremely selfish woman. She wants to exclude the whole world because she can't impose her narrow little order on it. I can't believe that. Harriet has a false yes. Walter, why do you suppose your appointment as director at the bank failed to go through? 
Well, I... Because Harriet insulted Mr. Littlefield's wife right here. I saw her do it. Auntie Austin. I saw her. And let me tell you something else I saw or rather heard. I was having luncheon at the colonnade, and a man and his wife came in and sat down near me. Immediately, she began to tell him how he should have sat and how he should sit and so on. At the table right near my elbow, I heard someone say, Listen to Craig's wife over there. People are talking about us? Of course. Your friends resent being told where they shall sit and how. So they're avoiding the occasion for it just as I'm going to avoid it. But you have to deal with it. But how? How should I deal with it? Make your wife realize that there's a man of the house here and that you are that man. Auntie Austin, I can't be convinced that there isn't an enormous element of misunderstanding between you and Harriet. We can thrash this whole affair out somehow. No. No house is big enough, Walter, for two women who are interested in the same man. I must go. I'm not happy here. What will you do if you leave here? What I've always wanted to do, travel. I want to see things and places and people so that I'll never become little. Oh, I have such a deadly fear of that after these past two years. But I promised Mother that you'd always have a home with me. You haven't a home to offer me, Walter. You have a house with furniture in it, that's all. I have the impression when I look at these rooms that they're rooms that have died and are laid out. Well, whatever they are, they'll seem less if you leave them, Auntie. I don't think I'd feel worse if it were Mother herself who were leaving. Be glad that it isn't your mother, Walter. She would have left long ago. Good evening. Is Mr. Craig in? Yes, sir, he's in. Shall I have Hello, him? Hello, Billy. How are you? Hello, Walt. I've been trying to get hold of you since 4 o'clock this afternoon. Huh? Well, come in. What's on your mind, Billy? What about it, Walt? About what? About Fergus and his wife. Haven't you seen the papers? No. Why, what, what's happened, Billy? Fergus and his wife are dead. What? Why, it's in every paper in town. Here. Here it is in the front page. Read it. Dead. This is horrible. I saw Adelaide myself last night. I stopped in for a drink, and there she was with that fellow she'd been going out with. Dead. I have a hunch Fergus had heard of the affair and called her on it when she got in last night. You know he was jealous of her. Oh, this is terrible. I think I ought to get in touch with the police right away. Well, that's why I wanted to get hold of you. It says in the paper they're looking for a man seen leaving the house after midnight, and I of thought... Of course, that... that must be me. I'll call the police. Well, now, wait a minute, Walter. What about your wife? She's back. She'll probably read it sometime. Well, if she doesn't see the papers, what she doesn't know won't hurt her. And this thing might clear itself up overnight. I think the wise move is to get over to Passmore's. And if they don't know anything more there, go to police headquarters and let them know where we're at. Come on. Through the park will be quickest. Yes? Dinner's ready, Mrs. Craig. I'll be right down. Will you tell Miss Landreth? Yes, ma'am. Fashionable Willows Avenue resident, scene of double tragedy. Bodies of J. Fergus Passmore and wife. Passmore! Walter! Walter, are you downstairs? Walter! Mrs. Craig, dinner is... Maisie, where's Mr. Craig? Why, he was here with a gentleman. What gentleman? Who was he? I don't know who he was. Did Mr. Craig go away with him? I guess he must have. He might be in the garage. Run out and see. Tell him to come back. I want to see him. Yes, ma'am. Right away. Hurry, Maisie! Hurry! After a brief intermission, Mr. DeMille and our stars Rosalind Russell and Herbert Marshall will bring us Act Two of Craig's Wife. Are you one of that distinctive group of women whose coloring could be called Titian or Auburn or reddish blonde? If so, you probably have quite fair, delicate skin. And you'll be interested in what a famous redhead has to say about her complexion care. It's Barbara Stanwyck, and she tells you... I use Lux Toilet Soap. It agrees with my skin. Gives it thorough, gentle care. But perhaps your hair and eyes are dark, 
and you have the real brunette coloring that's so lovely. Listen to what stunning dark-haired Claudette Colbert has to say. There's nothing more important to charm than smooth, easy-to-look-at skin. I always use Lux Toilet Soap. It has active lather that leaves my skin feeling smoother, looking so fresh. Well, I'm certainly not forgetting the true blondes, those blue-eyed, golden-haired ladies whose fair skin reminds you of delicate porcelain. Virginia Bruce is a perfect example of that exquisite type. She uses gentle white Lux Toilet Soap regularly, too. Here's what she says. Want your skin to stay lovely? Lux Soap Active Lather Facials are a wonderful help. Here's what you do. Pat the lather lightly in, rinse with warm water, then with cool, and pat the face dry with a soft towel. I love this easy, gentle care. Yes, whether they're blonde, brunette, or redhead, or brownette for that matter, nine out of ten famous Hollywood stars use Lux Toilet Soap. And any woman knows that a soap has to be pretty special to be the choice of these lovely women to whom beauty is a profession. And Lux Toilet Soap is pretty special. It's as mild, as pure, as fine a soap as money can buy. It's a soap to use for delicate skin because its creamy, active lather removes dust, dirt, and stale cosmetics thoroughly and gently, too. What a wonderful buy this fine soap is. It costs only a few cents a cake. Why don't you use this simple, easy care the beautiful women of the screen find so effective? Try Lux Soap Active Lather Facials for 30 days. You'll find they work for you, too. We pause now for station identification. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. Act two of Craig's Wife, starring Rosalind Russell as Harriet Craig and Herbert Marshall as Walter, with Beulah Bundy as Miss Austin. Ten minutes have passed, and Mrs. Craig waits anxiously for her husband to return. Nervously, she paces the length of her immaculate living room, the newspaper clenched tightly in her hand newspaper telling of the death of her husband's friends. Suddenly, the telephone rings. Hello? Yes? Long distance? All right. Hello? Yes, this is Mrs. Craig. Oh. Why, Ethel is lying down just now. Who is this speaking, please? Oh, Mr. Fredericks. No, no, uh, she's quite all right, really. Well, I'd much rather not call her if you don't mind. Well, can't you tell me what it is you want to tell her? Oh, I see. Well, I'm sorry, Mr. Fredericks. I don't care to disturb her just now. Goodbye. Maisie, the door. Yes, ma'am. Mr. Craig in? No, sir, he's not in just now. Oh, his wife in? Yes, sir. Who is it, Maisie? We'd like to speak to her for a minute if we could. Yes, sir. Will you just step in? Thank you. It's two gentlemen, Mrs. Craig. Good evening. Oh. Are you Mrs. Craig? Yes, yes, I am. That will be all, Maisie. Uh, yes, ma'am. Have you any idea what time Mr. Craig will be in? Why, I'm expecting him any minute. Is there something I can do? Yes, I think so. We thought we'd like to speak to Mr. Craig first, but I, I don't suppose it makes a great deal of difference. It's about the Passmore shooting affair. Oh, yes. Yes, I've just been reading about it. Oh? Isn't it a dreadful thing? Well, it's rather a peculiar case. Of course, it could have been a foiled attempt at robbery, but that doesn't explain certain other conditions. Are you working on the case? Oh, yes, ma'am. I'm Captain Cattell from headquarters. This is Lieutenant Grover. How Evening. do you do? However, there's no connection between that and our visit here. Well, I'm very glad to know that. Of course, we do have to follow up any little outside clue. Now, uh, a man was seen leaving the house shortly after midnight, but it was too dark to establish any identification. Besides, that wouldn't account for the death of Mrs. Passmore. You see, she didn't get in until after 3 o'clock. I see. Then you think Mr. Craig might be the man that was seen leaving there last night? Oh, no. 
That possibility is really not being seriously considered. You see, a house of that description might have had any number of visitors during the evening. That's very true. But you see, Mrs. Craig, we had a report from the telephone exchange that there was a call made from here this evening asking for the address of Mr. Passmore's home. You mean that somebody called from here? I can't imagine who it was. The report says it was a woman's voice. Well, that's very extraordinary. It could have been one of the servants, of course. Oh. Merely curious, I suppose. However, I dare say there's some very simple explanation of it. If the call was actually made from here. Hmm. Has the, uh, the telephone been used at all, to your knowledge, Mrs. Craig, since five o'clock this afternoon? No, no. Oh, yes. I just answered a call a few minutes ago from Northampton. I see. Has uh, anyone from the outside been in here since five o'clock this afternoon? No. That is, except a neighbor from across the street. I scarcely think she would have used the telephone, though. I can ask Miss Austin, my husband's aunt. Well, if you don't mind, I'd like to question everyone here. Oh, uh, first, though, I'd like to call headquarters. Oh, go right make. ahead. Thank you. Did you know Mr. and Mrs. Passmore, Mrs. Craig? Oh, no. But I mean, I could hardly call it knowing them. I'd met them, of course, but I haven't seen either of them for ages. I see. Hello, this is Cattell. I thought I'd better call and check with you, but... What? Oh, well, that's good news. I'll be right down. I'll get Miss Austin for you. Oh, no, it won't be necessary, Mrs. Craig. I've just had word that additional information has come in at headquarters. It looks like the case is just about ready to break. You? Where have you been, Walter? Out with Billy Burkmeyer. Why? Come in and shut the door. Why, what, what's the matter, Harriet? Walter, what do you know about Fergus Passmore and his wife? I don't know any more about it than you do, Harriet. I've been nearly out of my mind for the last half hour. I couldn't find you anywhere. Why didn't you call me then and not go rushing out of the house? I didn't want to upset but you. I certainly couldn't have been any more upset than I have been. I thought probably you'd been arrested or something. What would I be arrested for? Why, in connection with the Passmore thing, of course. The police are looking for you. You know that, don't you? Who says the police are looking for me? Two detectives just left here not half an hour ago. What do they want? Doesn't it say in the paper there that you were seen leaving Passmore's at 12 o'clock last night? Doesn't say that I was seen leaving there. Well, who else could it have been but you? You were out there playing cards, weren't you? Yes, of course. Did they say they knew I was out there last night? I don't remember what they said exactly. I was too upset. I was never placed in such a position in my life. I didn't know what to say except that you'd be back soon. Where did you go with Birkmeyer? Over to Fergus's house. And what in heaven's name did you do a thing like that for? Well, why not? Well, do you want your name dragged into a thing like this, Walter? My name will be dragged into it anyway, won't it? But you don't have to go rushing out to meet a lot of scandalous publicity. I should think your own common sense would show you what it would mean to have your name even mentioned in a thing of this kind. Why, it would be in every newspaper in the country. That wouldn't bother me in the least, Harriet. My conscience is clear. Oh, don't be so absurdly romantic, Walter. It isn't a question of being romantic. No, and it isn't a question of conscience either. It's simply a matter of discretion. If you had nothing to do with this thing, what's the use of becoming involved? What do you mean, if I had nothing to do with it? Oh, don't stop picking me up on my every word. And don't smoke in this room. There are plenty of other places in the house to smoke, if you want to smoke. I don't know where they are. <laughs> Did the... Uh, Detectives say when they'd be back here? I don't know whether they did or not, but if they do come back, Walter, don't give them any more information than I did. Well, I certainly won't deny that I was a friend of Fergus Passmore. You don't have to deny that you were his friend, but you certainly don't have to submit to a lot of cross-examination. Let them go cross-examine some of Fergus's other friends. Did he say he'd seen any other of Fergus's friends? Walter, I don't know. I told you I was upset. I hardly know what they said. Well, I think I'll call up Burkmeyer. They might have gone over there to see him, too. Wait a minute, Walter. Don't. Well, why not? You can't call him now. Well, why not? Don't you realize the telephone is being watched? And if the police are probably watching Burke Myers, too, the first thing they do in a case of this kind is to watch the telephone calls in and out of the house. Not from this house. I mean from Fergus's house. I wasn't going to call Fergus's house. I was going to call Billy Burke What difference does it make, Walter? Do you think the police can't put two and two together? Burke Meyer called you last night at Passmore's, didn't he? And there's undoubtedly a record of that call. Well, that wouldn't involve my name. It would if the operator listened in. Do you suppose she has nothing to do but listen in on calls? Well, she listened in on this one, didn't she? On which one? What? What did she say? Which call did you say the operator listened in on? I don't know which one she listened in on. But someone must have listened in on something. 
or the detectives wouldn't have come here. Didn't they say when the call was made? What does it matter when it was made? The fact remains that our telephone is undoubtedly being watched now. Well, I want to know why it's being Listen watched. Listen to me, Walter. Put down that telephone. I will not allow you to drag my name into a notorious scandal. Harriet, I've got to find out where I am in this if thing. If you speak over that telephone, I'll leave this house. What do you mean, you'll leave this house? I mean exactly what I say. I don't want my name associated with a thing of this kind. Your name? Oh, ours, of course, both of us. But suppose something developed that would reveal the fact that I had been to Passmore's last night. Wouldn't it be better for me to be open and above board from the beginning? They're bound to be suspicious if I'm not. There are grounds for suspicions, Walter. What grounds? The fact that I was over there last night doesn't mean a thing. It isn't for me to determine the degree of your guilt or innocence. I'm not interested. You're not interested? I am interested only in the impression on the popular mind and the respect in the community we've got to live in. You mean you'd rather know I was involved in this thing and keep the respect of the community than know I was a victim of circumstances and lose it? Mrs. Craig, are you going to have dinner now? All right, Mrs. Harold. We'll be right in. Mrs. Harold, just a minute. You're not questioning the servants in front of me, are you? I am. I won't stay here. That's up to you, Harriet. Did you want to speak to me, Mr. Craig? Uh, Mrs. Harold, do you know if anybody has called Levering 3100 from this phone today? No, sir. You didn't have occasion to call that number, did you? Why, no, sir. I never even thought about it until Mrs. Craig asked me for it. She... All right, Mrs. Harold, thank you very much. Walter, it's about time you got back. Where did you go? I've been out walking. Walking? <laughs> I don't suppose it makes any difference to you that we held dinner for over half an hour. Walter, answer me. Harriet, that call today. Well? It was you who made that call, wasn't it? What were you doing, checking up on me? <laughs> Don't flatter yourself, Walter. The man hasn't been born yet that I'd bother checking up on. Why didn't you tell the truth? Because I anticipated an attack of your romantic conscience. You were playing safe. At my expense. I knew the necessity of it. I knew if I told you I made that call, you'd be on the telephone in five minutes telling the police. I intended doing that anyway. You silly fool. That's where I went with Billy Burkmire to police headquarters. Oh, and you... And the only reason I didn't tell them then was the, the man in charge of the case wasn't there. But I'm going to see him tonight and I'll tell him then. You can tell them that I'm leaving you, Harriet, too. why weren't you at least honest with me? Not try to make it appear that I was responsible for this thing. It's you that the police are looking for. Oh, you needn't try to turn on me. They wouldn't be looking for either of us if you'd stayed at home last night, instead of being out card-playing with a lot of irregular people. What was there irregular about Fergus there Passmore? There must have been some irregularity, or this thing wouldn't have happened. Oh, I knew as soon as my back was turned that you'd be out visiting your friends again. You wouldn't be visiting them had I been here. How'd you stop me? Lock the door? It wouldn't have been necessary. You haven't been visiting your friends in the last 18 months, have you? Then you have kept my friends out of here. If I have, the end justified the means. My aunt said that you've driven all my friends away from me. Well? She also said something else, and I'm beginning to believe she's right. She said you were trying to get rid of me without actually driving me away from the house. I don't know what you're talking yes, about. Yes, you do. That's why you left the room before she started. I'm sorry I didn't stay now. You should have, Harriet. Oh, how perfectly she knows you. And I felt rather sorry listening to her. I thought she was getting a little old and suspicious. Particularly when she said you had excluded my friends. But that's just what you've done. Oh, don't try to make yourself out a martyr. You've had your share of the bargain. I never regarded our marriage as a bargain. Did you expect me to go into a thing as important as marriage with my eyes shut? I wanted you to go into it honestly as I went into it. But you've exploited me. You'd even let the police think me a murderer just to preserve your own safety. I've been trying to preserve my home. What else is a woman like me but her home? Hasn't she her husband? She could lose her husband, couldn't she? Many women have. Couldn't she lose her home, too? She couldn't, if she knew how to secure it. You mean if she knew how to fix it for herself? All right, you haven't lost anything by it. If I fix things for myself, I fix them for you, too. I haven't done anything that wasn't honest. How would you know, Harriet? I've simply tried to be practical. But with your usual romanticism, you want to make me appear like a criminal. <sighs> I'm not reproaching you. You simply married the wrong man. I married a romantic fool. That's what I married. How well we understand each other now. Well, I understand you anyway. And you should be glad that I do. I don't know what would become of you if I didn't. The brass of you, the presumption. 
What have you ever done to assume such superiority? Now, don't get yourself into a temper. Mrs. Craig, Mrs. Harold said you wanted to see me. I do, Maisie. I want to know why I found this card back of my vase on the mantelpiece. Well, you see, a, a lady came while you were at dinner. She was collecting for some charity affair. And you and I... couldn't find any place for her card except behind this vase. Well, Mrs. How Cra many times have I told you not to touch anything on the mantelpiece? But I only thought... I'm not interested in what you thought. When a girl won't do as she's told, then she'd better leave. I want you to get your things together tonight and be out of here tomorrow morning. Yes, ma'am. I'm going up to Ethel's room, Walter. I'll speak to you when you've calmed down a little. Her house. Her precious home. Her precious vase. Good heavens, Mr. Craig. Did something get smashed in here? <gasps> Glory be. Her vase fell off the mantelpiece. No, Mrs. Harold, I smashed it myself. You... Well, I wish you'd tell her it was you that done it, Mr. Craig. She might think maybe I done it. I'll tell her all about it, don't worry. Yes, Mr. Craig. Walter? Did something fall down there? No. Are you sure? Yes, I'm sure. Well, it sounded up here as though the house fell down. Maybe it did, Harriet. I'm just sitting here wondering. In just a moment, Mr. DeMille and our stars, Rosalind Russell and Herbert Marshall, will present Act Three of Craig's Wife. And now let's tune our microphones to a very small apartment in a very large city. Anne Graham has just come home and... Oh, my goodness, what a day. That office gets more hectic all the time. It seems as if five o'clock would never come. Oh, I wouldn't stir out of this apartment tonight for... for... Oh, well, I'll just see who it is. Hello? Oh, David. Oh, fine, thanks. What? Tonight? Why, why, I'd love it. Okay, goodbye, David. Now I've done it. Not only going out, but dancing. Oh, but I'll feel like new after I've had my bath. Golly, I'll have to hurry. That bath that Anne's looking forward to, depending on, is an active lather bath with gentle Lux toilet soap. She's looking forward to it because she's learned that a few minutes relaxation in this luxurious bath makes her feel like new, even at the end of a trying day. She likes the way the creamy Lux soap lather bursts into tiny sparkling bubbles, sparkling gay bubbles that seem to carry away worries and cares. She likes the way the creamy lather caresses her skin rinses easily away, leaving skin feeling so smooth and soft. Anne thoroughly enjoys this daily beauty bath of hers, but what's more important, she depends on it to protect daintiness. You see, Lux Soap's active lather is gentle, but thorough. It carries away perspiration, every trace of dust and dirt, leaves skin really fresh, sweet, Yes, a daily Lux soap bath is a delightful way to make sure of that feminine charm that means so much. You're sure to enjoy this luxurious beauty bath, sure to love the delicate clinging fragrance that Lux toilet soap's exclusive perfume leaves on your skin. Try it. Now, our producer, Mr. DeMille. The curtain rises on the third act of Craig's Wife. And remember this, Harriet. People who live to themselves are generally left to themselves. Those were Auntie Austin's words, delivered in a warning to Harriet Craig. It's early the following morning, and Auntie Austin has already left the house. 
In the living room, where Walter passed the night sleeping in a chair, Mrs. Craig discovers her precious vase has been smashed to bits. Mrs. Harold, what is this? Don't tell me it's that beautiful little vase. Yes, ma'am. How did it happen? How? Well, Mr. Craig said Look that... at it. It's smashed into a thousand pieces. It must have fallen on the bricks oh, there. Oh, that never simply fell, Mrs. Harold. It's absolutely shattered. Look at the size of the pieces. Oh, that beautiful thing that I wouldn't even allow anybody to go near. Look at it now. How on earth did it ever happen, Mrs. Harold? I don't know, I'm sure. I suppose Maisie broke it for spite, didn't she? No, she didn't break it, Mrs. Craig. She was out there in the kitchen with me when we heard it fall. Well, send her in to me now. I want to speak to her. Mr. Craig said that he broke it. What? Yes, ma'am. Tell Maisie I want to see her. She isn't here, Mrs. Craig. She's gone. You mean she's left already? Yes, ma'am. She left right after her. she had her breakfast. Of course she did, the contemptible... I'm crazy. leaving myself, Mrs. Craig. Oh, are you? I'm going this morning. I'm meeting Miss Austin downtown at noon. Hmm, Miss Austin. And where are you going with her? Well, she told me last night she was leaving. She said she was going to travel for a few years. And do you think it's very considerate of you, Mrs. Harold, to walk away this way without giving me any notice? You didn't give Maisie much notice last night, Mrs. Craig. Maisie didn't deserve any notice. She was a very disobedient girl. She absolutely refused to do what I told her. Well, I haven't always done exactly what you told me to do either, Mrs. Craig. So maybe I deserve to go as well as Maisie. Well, of course, you can suit yourself. But I hope you don't intend to leave without cleaning up this floor. I've got the dustpan right here. Where is Mr. Craig? He's in his study, ma'am. He's reading the paper. I'll give you your money later. I hope you enjoy your world tour, Mrs. Harold. It'll be a change anyway. And I hope when you come back, you'll be able to find a place that'll be as easy as this one has been. Don't worry about me, Mrs. Craig. Nobody belonging to me ever died in the poorhouse. Walter, I want to speak to you. What does the paper say? You needn't worry, Harriet. You're quite safe. What does it say? Fergus's brother got in last night from Pittsburgh with a letter that Fergus had written him intimating his intentions. Then Fergus did it himself? So it appears. I always told you he was jealous of his wife. It's a good thing I kept my head last night and didn't allow you to telephone and make a show of us all. You can thank me that your name isn't in every paper in the city this morning. Oh, I can thank you for more than that, Harriet. I can thank you for having given me a new name last night that fits me so perfectly that I've decided to continue its use. You called me a romantic fool. Let's not go into all that again, Walter. I've been wanting to help you, but you, you don't seem to have sense enough to appreciate it. Is that all you want before I got to leave for the office? No, it isn't all I want you for. I want to know about the ornament that was broken last night. What about it? I don't know what about it. That's the reason I'm asking you. Mrs. Harold tells me here this morning that you told her last night that you'd broken it. So I did. Well, you must be proud of yourself. I was for a moment. What were you doing, leaning against the mantelpiece again, as no, usual? No, it wasn't an accident. I did it deliberately. What do you mean, you did it deliberately? I mean that I smashed it purposely. What for? I became suddenly heroic. I smashed it into a thousand little pieces, and then I smoked one cigarette after another till I had your sanctum sanctorum absolutely littered with ashes and cigarette butts. For about an hour last night, I was a pretty brave fellow around here. You, you should have seen me. Are you out of your mind or something? No. I'm particularly clear in my mind, especially I was last night. You made a remark then, Harriet, that completely illuminated me. Like a flash of lightning, I saw it all. For the first time. Unfortunately, the lightning struck my home and knocked it down. I sat here all night wondering how I might build it up again. What remark are you talking about? You said that a woman might lose her husband, but not her home, if she knew how to secure well, it. Well, hasn't many a woman lost her husband? And many a man has lost his life, too, because his wife has never made a sufficiently illuminating remark. I saw your entire plan then, Harriet, and my instincts called for immediate action. So, as an opening gun, I smashed the vase. And I was going to smash all the other little ornaments that you worshipped before me. 
I was going to rule my house with a rod of iron. Oh, Walter, you're so romantic. But I couldn't silly. sustain the role indefinitely. You're right. I am a romantic fool. Ah, but I do wish you could have seen my attempt to be otherwise. At least you would have appreciated my sincerity to try to continue here as your husband. What do you mean? Your attempt to continue here as my husband? The role is not for me, Harriet. I can only play a romantic part. Ethel! Ethel, are you in your room? Open the door, dear. Ethel, what's the matter with you? What are you doing? I'm packing my things, Aunt Harriet. Ethel, what on earth is... Why didn't you tell me that Mr. Frederick's called last night? I didn't think it was wise to bother you. Bother me? He thought I just didn't want to speak to him. You had no right to do that, Aunt Harriet. Did he call again? Yes, just before. He wants me to meet him. We're going to be married. Well, I hope you know what you're doing. If anything goes wrong, at least it'll be my mistake. If that's any consolation to you. When are you going? On the 510. Uncle Walter's driving me to the station. Oh, I see. Aunt Harriet. Yes? Aunt Harriet, is Uncle Walter leaving you? Why, what on earth ever put that into your head? Well, when I started to come down the stairs this morning, I heard him say that he couldn't continue here as your husband. I'm sure I haven't the faintest idea of what you're talking about. Then a while ago, when I told him I was going to be married, he said the only thing I needed to consider seriously was whether or not we had faith in each other and were absolutely honest about it. Dear Walter. <laughs> so I was wondering if he found out. Found out what? What you told me coming down here on the train. And I said I didn't think you were being honest. <laughs> Don't be a fool, darling. Walter couldn't get along without me. Ethel, are you ready? Already, Uncle Walter. Goodbye, Aunt Harry. Goodbye, dear. Your grips are in the car. I'll be right along with you. All right. I'll write to you, Aunt Harry. Yes, don't forget, dear. Well, Walter, you won't be late for dinner, will you? Yes, very late, Harriet. In fact, I won't be here at all. Here's the key to your car and the garage. My house key's on the hall table. Now, listen to me, Walter Craig. You're surely not serious about leaving this house. I should think that decision would please you. Well, it doesn't please me at all. It's absolutely ridiculous. But it's so practical. Oh, don't try to be funny. And you've been deploring my lack of practicality for so long. I'd like to know what's practical about a man walking out and leaving his wife in his home. I have no wife to leave. You neither loved me nor honored me. Well, you married me, whether I did or not. I never saw you before in my life, Harriet. Until last night. Well, you married me, didn't you? And you married a house. If it's agreeable to you, I'll see that you have it, and you can go on having it, just as though I were here. You'll be here, unless I'm very much mistaken. You don't know your man, Harriet? I know him well enough for that, anyway. Oh, you knew him pretty well, I'll grant you that, particularly when you said that my mind worked very slowly. It's working pretty slowly now, when you don't appreciate the absurdity of a move of this kind. What did I do last night that was so terrible? You simply showed your hand, that was all. I kept you from making a fool of yourself, that's what I did. But you also showed me how I could keep from making a fool of myself in the future. Well, you're certainly not beginning very auspiciously, I can tell you that. But I shall be at least a self-respecting fool. And that's something I could never be if I stayed here. There's something in a man, Harriet, that I suppose is his essential manhood. And you insulted that last night. Where are you going when you leave here? That would be rather interesting to know, Harriet. Where a lot like me are going. Out of fashion, possibly. Goodbye, Harriet. Walter. Walter! Yes? Telegram from Mrs. Walter Craig. Thank you. Oh. Is there an answer, Mrs. Craig? No. No, there is no answer. Your... Your sister... passed away... at four o'clock this afternoon. Is 
anyone at home? Oh, Mrs. Crane. Yes? I do hope you'll pardon my walking in, but I wanted to bring Miss Austin some roses. Miss Austin isn't here, Mrs. Fraser. Well, if you'll just tell her I left them. Yes, yes, of course. Is there, is there anything wrong, Mrs. Craig? My, my sister died this afternoon. Oh, I'm sorry. I had no idea she was so ill, or I'd have never come back. I'm so sorry. I do hope you'll let me know if there's anything I can do. Thank you very much. I don't think there's anything anybody can do. I'll give the roses to Miss Austin when I see her. Thank you. Well, I suppose you want to be alone, Mrs. Craig. I'll just run along. Goodbye, Mrs. Craig. Alone? Remember this, Harriet. People who live to themselves are generally left to themselves. Alone? People who live to themselves are generally left to themselves. No. People who live to themselves are generally left to themselves. No, no! People who live to themselves are generally left to themselves. We chalk up two more fine performances on the record of this theater. And here are the stars responsible, Rosalind Russell and Herbert Marshall. Thank you, Mr. DeMille. I've been looking forward to doing Craig's Wife with Bart Marshall for weeks now. And so have I, Rosalind. We seem to have been working across one studio street or another for years without landing in the same picture. <laughs> we're rather proud of the idea of casting you two together for the first time, and we're expecting plenty of imitators. How are you and Clark Gable getting along with that picture at MGM, Ross? Fine. You haven't got a good unused practical joke, have you? Some gag I could play on Clark? Not right offhand, no way. I owe him one. It keeps us busy living up to the title of the picture, Unholy Partners. <laughs> it's a brave girl, Bart, who proposes to out-practical joke one Clark Gable. I'm just looking for revenge, Mr. DeMille. <laughs> but now, before we say goodnight, there's a word or two I'd like to say to the women in this audience. It's about the product behind this theater, Lux Soap. I've used Lux Soap for a long time because it's such a wonderful help in keeping one's complexion soft and smooth. And I'd recommend it to any woman who wants a complexion soap that she can depend upon. And we recommend a close-up of you, Rosalind, as the best comment on Lux Soap. What's the play next week, CB? One of the screen's new hits, Bart. The universal picture, Model Wife. And we'll have the original stars, Dick Powell and Joan Blondell. Model Wife is the story of a modern young business couple with an old-fashioned uh, desire to raise a family. <laughs> it's, it's one of the most human and delightful comedies the screen has produced this season. So for a model evening's entertainment, we suggest Model Wife next Monday night. Craig's wife, then Model Wife. You're certainly getting domestic, Mr. DeMille. <laughs> but I know you'll have a great show next week. Good night. Good night, CB. Good night. Good night. We'll never go wrong with acting like yours. Our sponsors, the makers of Lux Toilet Soap, join me in inviting you to be with us again next Monday night when the Lux Radio Theater presents Dick Powell and Joan Blondell in Model Wife. This is Cecil B. DeMille saying good night to you from Hollywood. Russell and Russell appeared tonight through the courtesy of Metro Goldwyn Mayer. Herbert Marshall is now working in Samuel Goldwyn's production of The Little Foxes. Included in tonight's play were Jane Morgan as Mrs. Harold, Betty Moran as Ethel, Virginia Gordon as Maisie, Dwayne Thompson as Mrs. Fraser, Phillips Teed as Berkmeyer, and Charles Seal as Grover. Our music is directed by Louis Silvers. 
and your announcer has been Melville Roy. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. <laughs>